It's clear how much the Great Salt Lake has shrunk over the years, but there is something in the air that is not so clear. That is true. Tonight, new special Stan Spindle reveals the threats. Newly exposed dust and minerals at the lake pose to millions along the Wasatch Front. If you veer off the beaten path on the fringes of Leighton and Syracuse, chances are you'll find Kevin Perry. It's actually unfortunate how few people explore their own backyard. He's made it his mission to dive right into what used to be a body of water, but boats have long had no use here. The transportation of choice for this professor of atmospheric sciences at the U, a bicycle known as a fat bike, a research tool necessary to traverse Farmington Bay, and Kevin invited us along for the ride. And we are now at least four miles away from any water in Farmington Bay. Water flowing from the Jordan River used to spill into this lake bed, but now the narrow channel pools somewhere on the far side of Antelope Island. The lapping waves of this former marshland coming only from the heat radiating off its stark surface. And that's where the real problem is revealed. What looks like a packed, hard, salty playa can actually be pretty fragile. So here we have a place with a very thin, shallow crust. It's very fragile when the wind comes along it starts to pulverize this. As we pedaled, Kevin pointed out again and again, dust hot spots, places of particular concern that he believes make up as much as 9% of the now exposed lake bed. You've got this exposed area underneath, which is a incredible dust source. And so the dust is dangerous when the concentrations are high, regardless of what it's made out of. Dangerous now to the young, the elderly, and those with breathing issues. Potentially deadly down the road, as this dust is filled with cancer-causing, naturally occurring arsenic. Ten years ago, we weren't talking about dust plumes coming off of the Great Salt Lake. And it may take a decade to turn things around. This is a portable wind tunnel. It simulates wind speeds of up to 40 or 50 miles an hour. Kevin uses his bi-weekly research equipped with a state-of-the-art dust storm simulator to educate colleagues, the general public, and really anyone who will listen about the ticking time bomb that's not far off. The blade is going to spin from zero to 6,000 RPMs over about five-minute period. I've got an instrument here that will measure the amount of dust that's coming off of it. It's my hypothesis that the longer that the lake bed is exposed, these areas will grow. So here we have the ring where it was sealed and that sand was moving around. And it would have been a lot worse, but there's still crust there. On this sample, we learned what wind speed would be required to generate dust from this spot. And we learned that this spot right here has a lot of potential for being a dust source. For a cautionary tale on Utah's unwritten future of the Great Salt Lake, look no further than 600 miles to the southwest and a century into the past. California drained Owens Lake, essentially poaching the water from the Sierra Nevada to fuel growth in Los Angeles in 1913. That diversion of water created decades of what was the greatest source of dust in all of North America. With the attention on the population center of LA, it was easy to try to ignore the toxic cloud casting a long, dangerous shadow. How often have you paid a visit out here to the Great Salt Lake itself? Even longtime Utahns will tell you, not often, if at all. And unfortunately, this is a case of out of sight, out of mind. But we're going to have to bring back water to what used to be Farmington Bay in order to preserve life as we know it here along the Wasatch Front. I was uh, seriously considering uh, a future name change for Salt Lake City to Dust Lake City because that was the future that we were going to be facing. That dire designation isn't how Kevin feels now with more than a dozen laws and state statutes put in place just this session to address the water crisis. And it's not just about the dust. It's the fragile ecosystem. It's millions of migratory birds that stop and feed here in northern Utah. And it's about generations to come, believing that this is still the place to put down roots and raise a family. You know, we still have limitations. We have to have water to survive. We have to have water to grow crops. Without water, the population carrying capacity would have to be reduced. No reduction in population seems possible as Utah is the fastest growing state. So conservation will be critical to bring the water back here. If you ask, will the dust really impact me? It will impact everybody from Tremonton to Brigham City to Ogden, all the way down to Salt Lake City and Provo. Eventually the rains will return.
But the question is, will this ecosystem still be alive when those rains return? And we have the power to make choices to put more water into the lake now when it's needed the most. Reporting from the Great Salt Lake, Dan Spindle, KSL 5 News. Interesting story, Dan, thank you. This mega drought that's hurting the lake could last another 10 to 40 years based on examples of climate patterns through history. So it's up to us to take action now to save the lake. And you will find a lot more stories under the Great Salt Lake section on KSLTV.com, as well as information on the Great Salt Lake Collaborative as we look for ways to save this precious resource of water in our state. Now to the shrinking Great Salt Lake. At one point, it was home to a lakefront resort, bringing in some big crowds, including celebrities and U.S. presidents. New specialist Dan Spindle looks at the rise and fall of that resort and how it ties into our efforts to save the precious resource. The Great Salt Air. You've certainly seen what looks more like a modern knockoff palace from the Ottoman Empire, the roadside attraction of sorts, just off I-80 near Lake Point. It is a strange place and you go inside here and it's all this old wood. Chris Merritt, state historic preservation officer, told me step one in speaking about this strange historic structure is getting the history straight first because after all this building is an imposter. <laughs> That's been festooned to look like the first two salt air resorts. Fitting that a historian uses words that harken back to another time. Let's take a trip back to the Gilded Age of the 1890s when a building rose from the desert soil to define a region. No, not the Salt Lake Temple, finished in 1893. That same year, leadership for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints were excited about something less spiritual in nature. But for some, seeing the Great Salt Air for the first time must have been a religious experience. But this was grand. This was massive architecture. And it was meant to be imposing. It was meant to be this worldwide feature. They built it and the people did come. For the better part of a quarter century, this massive 100-foot tall pavilion lakefront resort hosted those looking for rest and relaxation away from the city in style. And it was easy to get here on the train from downtown, a 16-mile long straight shot. But if you search today for any sign of the bandstand, the Midway Games, the shops selling root beer and the 10-cent dolls to the masses, the dressing rooms lining what was a spacious section of this buoyant saltwater bay, nothing here. Yeah. Chances are you wouldn't find anything. But those piles that are way out there, that was Salt Air 1, where if you were swimming, it was a deck you could lay out on and rest. I followed Chris for more than a mile onto what is now flat, long since dry lake bed without many notable features but he knows just where to look. The piles that were driven in 1892, just before construction, these are probably those original poles. Wooden poles preserved by the salt that used to hold up the rail line over the water here. Posts that ran electric and telephone lines. That was a steam boiler. This thing operated for 80 plus years. Wow. Even pieces of bottles and dishes that tell the story of days gone by. Teacup handles, coffee mugs, corks from all those soda bottles. You're right underneath the big dance hall right here. The dining hall's kind of off to the side. Oh, oh yeah, there's the, this. yeah, those are the big fragments. Look at that design. That's 1930s. That's incredible. You have a little bit of everything. Uh, Countless imagine. hundreds of thousands showed up year after year to stand, sit, and swim in awe of this wonder of the West through waters thought to have healing in the shallow depths. I love it because it gives me perspective on my own place in this story. From the pioneers to U.S. presidents who enjoyed bathing in the waters where I'm standing right now, the Great Salt Lake was a draw for more than 50 years. And perhaps if the medicinal properties of the water itself were overblown, what we know for sure looking into the future is that this great fixture of our region isn't going to fix itself. For 50 years, people loved coming to the lake. People loved recreating out here. This is how they spent their weekend. This is how they spent their 4th of July. The world's largest dance floor, the Sunday concerts, even the eventual roller coaster couldn't save this space from destruction as fire gutted the great structure in the middle of the Roaring Twenties. So Saltaire II was born with a lot of promise, but not long after it reopened to a crowd of 10,000, big changes would threaten to shutter it for good. When the lake water goes up, everybody's happy. When lake waters go down, businesses close. The lake water, or lack thereof, coupled with the Great Depression, followed by another world war. 
The writing was on the wall for years, and after limping along into the 1950s, what was once great became a relic of the past, falling into decay and eventually burning to the ground for the last time, more than 50 years ago. So how does this lost history help us save the Great Salt Lake today? I'm not a biologist, I'm not a geologist, I'm not a water scientist, but I'm like, here's the history. Here's how we interacted with the lake. Here's its connection to all of us that we need to take into account. Do you think we have the opportunity to adjust and fix and, and bring back some of the glory of the lake? Is it possible? I think so. I think anything is possible. I'm standing in a place that celebrated the lake for 60 years. I think that's pretty neat. And yeah. it's a story that we don't tell enough of. As for this yellow knockoff along the freeway, well, they say imitation is the greatest form of flattery. If you celebrate something, you love it. And if you love it, Chris tells me, you'll save it. Reporting from the Great Salt Air, Dan Spindle, KSL 5 News. Pretty cool, that history there. You can sign up to tour the historic Salt Air site on the Great Salt Lake Collaborative website. That is greatsaltlakenews.org. Welcome back. It's supposed to be surrounded by water, but right now, Antelope Island, as we know it, is on life support, suffering from the shrinking Great Salt Lake. Our Dan Spindle set out with a local researcher to get an up-close look at an ecosystem on the verge of collapse. It's never an easy trek to get out to the edge of the Great Salt Lake these days. I always dread it. We did too. After Carrie Franz, a Weber State Associate Professor, showed us how she has to carry all of her own research equipment in a waterproof pack. All right. A journey that just months ago would have been made wading through the shallow depths, not walking along a seemingly rocky shoreline that's ever increasing. But I love taking people out to see the lake because it's such a beautiful place. Even now that it's dying, it's still this just stunningly, this quiet, beautiful space. They're all microbialites, all of these lumpy bits. Carrie has come to appreciate these saline waters over the last several years. She enjoys monthly journeys to the northern shores of Antelope Island, which truly has become a desert island. Emphasis on the desert. I'm really worried about fixing things right now because we're at this tipping point. As water levels of the Great Salt Lake reach all-time lows again, making it an island in name only during this mega drought. It's like... Uh a little biosphere. Samuel Ramsey has spent even more time out here. He's a Utah transplant from a quarter century ago, spending most weekdays hiking five to 10 miles around this rough end of the island that doesn't seem to be home to much other than the longtime residents that don't like visitors like us disturbing their day-to-day -day routines. This area, for the casual observer, doesn't seem like much other than the, the, the bison herd. Samuel and Carrie have one thing in common. They are concerned the recent drastic changes to the lake will be irreversible. So this area has gone from just like the tips of some of these microbialites that you see here sticking out of the surface, like, you know, that much, to now we have this huge expanse that's all bleached out and dying. Bleaching is one problem, but another color is just as concerning. These salty pink pools are what's left behind of what was a thriving, vibrant biological landscape here. And as recently as not years ago, but just months ago, all of this was covered in water. And this landscape needs that blanket of water for protection. These are structures that are built by microorganisms that live in the lake. Microbialite mounds make for what looks like a dusty, sandy, somewhat solid surface of rock, or at least some familiar-looking geologic formations of some kind. But that is the true deception of this Dead Sea. It's anything but. Get some stuff out. These are sampling supplies and instruments. Carrie takes samples from these mounds that, while gray in color at first, are really teeming with life and photosynthetic activity. That's alive. This here is alive. Green proof of a living ecosystem just centimeters beneath the surface. Every month I come out here, I characterize the environment and also take samples of the microbialites to monitor how healthy they are. She'll segment and measure pigments of this biological matter back in the lab. But the bigger question for this shrinking but still massive body of water, just how salty can it get? And for how long before life on the Great Salt Lake is choked out of existence? The ocean, for context, is about 3.5% salinity. The Great Salt Lake would thrive between about 5 and 15%. The more salt that's in the sample, the more the light bends, the more it refracts. Today's samples from White Rock Bay 
well over 18%, meaning life here cannot survive at this level of salinity. We're at this point where we can't wait any longer. We can't let the lake continue dropping without seeing some really severe consequences. Conservation efforts are in place, and the legislature is passing new laws to protect the lake and get water flowing from our mountains to the basin once again. But whether or not it's enough to save these mounds that made up the building blocks of life billions of years ago, that's something only time and a whole lot more water will tell. Reporting from Antelope Island, Dan Spindle, KSL 5 News. Incredible, Inc incredible images too to see how it is developing at this moment. Well, you can learn a lot more about the Great Salt Lake Collaborative and the focus on the health of Antelope Island at greatsaltlakenews.org. Utah's serious water shortage is forcing the agriculture community to change their ways. Yeah, and it could change the future of farming all across the state. Our own Dan Spindle traveled to Emory County to see one high-tech solution in action. You can talk about conserving water till the cows come home, but any conversation surrounding the drought crisis in our state starts with the people who've worked this land for generations. They know the issues and they more than anyone want to address them long term. Their way of life depends on it. What it is, it's a solution to a problem. Whether the rancher has a shortage of water problem, a shortage of acre problem. Lee Magnuson is talking about sustainability he wants to bring to the most arid corners of Utah in the form of new technology using hydroponic grow systems by HydroGreen. That's the plant time. Lee's big brother Rod is way ahead of him. And this requires no soil. No soil, no fertilization. No fertilization. No. Nope. Simply applications the, the, of some water. The energy of the seed. While he's not on the payroll, Rod could be an ambassador for this new method that just might change the way farmers and ranchers do business in the Beehive State and beyond, feeding their livestock not from the fields, but from these long trays sprouting grains seemingly in no time at all. When I seen it, I'm like, I've got to do that. It's all about conservation. And when you think about the fraction of the water and the time versus what it would take to grow the typical grain, this red wheat went from this yesterday to this just five days later, and it's almost ready to go. This will become feed for livestock within hours. And then this is all palatable, the roots, everything, they eat it all. Rod tells me this beautiful green growth can supplement some of the nutritional needs of his 1,200 head of cattle. It doesn't replace the need for pasture grazing or trucking in hay and straw from other places, but it does cut it down, saving money and saving a lot of water. My 80-acre pivot will use the same amount of water in four and a half days as this building will in 365 days. In a year. In a year. <laughs> Consider the nearly 18,000 Utah farms. What if just 1% of those operations installed some kind of vertical farming with a year-long harvest window? Compare that to the two Olympic-sized swimming pools worth of water traditionally needed for each season for every acre of alfalfa. Best case scenario with hydrogreen, a 93% drop in water use. Now imagine the entire dry Intermountain region, 141,000 farms across 121 million acres. How many swimming pools worth would that save with just a fraction installing greenhouse-style growing facilities to supplement some of the fresh forage needed to keep the animals fed. You could put one unit, 10 units, 20 units. The scale and scope of the retrofit at any given operation depends on whether or not it would work. These longtime rural Utah ranchers recognize it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. But farming into the future isn't getting any easier here. Try to buy into farming. Try to buy into ranching. It's impossible. If you don't have the land in the family, uh, you're not going to buy in. But buying into a potential fix to the water and land crisis, that's a seed the Magnusons and others are willing to plant in hopes that this parched landscape gives them a shot at success for years to come. In Emory County, Dan Spindle, KSL 5 News. That is pretty promising. You can read more about this hydro green technology and how viable a solution it is, especially as we look for ways to save the Great Salt Lake on our website at ksltv.com. The Great Salt Lake's forgotten shoreline history is something state leaders want back in the public eye. Yeah, and tonight we're taking you to a one-storied spot that for decades invited only delinquency and decay. New specialist Dan Spindle has its story of renewal. If 
love industry is the Utah State motto. Perhaps the place that best embodies that sentiment is near Lake Point. After all, you've got the mine, the interstate, the railroad. But this r and representing the work ethic of stone and steel, has some actual shade on the r and that began on a path just feet away. So it's a very narrow shot where you can avoid the lake. The rest and relaxation of Black Rock Beach. We know for 13,000 years, humans have been passing by this location and seeing it from the shoreline in high water years or being able to walk down in lower water years. Those prehistoric peoples who traveled the Great Basin may have seen the actual Black Rock itself crashing down from the nearby Ochre Mountains, leaving that massive lump of limestone near the water's edge. But when our most recent ancestors rolled into the territory in July of 1847, there was no question. They were a lot like us. They'd rather be at the beach than building a settlement. Brigham Young, Orson Pratt, Wilford Woodruff all came out here for the first documented recreational swim in Great Salt Lake thus started the love affair with this stretch of shoreline for decades. And so we have a deep recreational history at Black Rock that's largely just been erased after the abandonment in the 1960s. So before the mid 20th century brought on the black eye of a public space that most would tag Black Rock, best displayed here in this 3D rendering linked to the Utah State History website of all the graffiti and the grime and the gunk that we're so familiar with, what was it like? Once described as grim and ugly, even by a 19th century observer, this natural feature was both a figurative and literal island, depending on the lake water levels and the recreational preferences of those who called Utah home. Coming right across the lake, and there was a little walkway pier out there. Countless locals and visiting dignitaries alike flocked here, first taking the four-hour-long wagon ride from Salt Lake, then by rail, before the automobile era brought car lovers cruising to the west in just under 30 minutes. Heber C. Kimball even built a home that stood here until I-80 steamrolled certain remnants of the past. But the prominent Latter-day Saint apostle and pioneer put his stamp on this history here, too. Really, aside from the massive black rock itself, you can barely tell that there was any resort here along this section of the Great Salt Lake. And much like the Great Salt Air Resort and other picturesque spots, they had their season and they died out. The idea now today is to bring people back here. As an archaeologist, I like to touch the things. It makes it more real to me. It makes me more connected than reading it in a book. Thanks to Chris Merritt and other historians and a whole lot of volunteers, this notable natural feature is not only restored now to its former glory, Black Rock is getting its time to shine as a featured spot on the California National Trail and protection on the National Registrar of Historic Places. So in the last really four years, we've had to try to turn it back to what it used to be, its natural beauty and its connection with history. The massive cleanup effort that's sure to be ongoing will serve as a postcard of sorts, calling all history lovers and lake enthusiasts back once again, walking instead of floating this time, but most importantly, feeling. Yeah, they're going to learn a little bit about history, but they're going to get a connection and maybe a passion to help us all protect the lake for the next generation. For 100 years, four generations of people could come out to Black Rock Beach and go swim and recreate, go boating, yachting, and it was really a great place for all Utahns to come enjoy. Chris hopes the new and improved Black Rock can help Utahns relate to those who spent so much time here resting and relaxing as we all work toward a renewed Great Salt Lake. Reporting from Black Rock, Dan Spindle, KSL 5 News. And we want to thank the Utah State Historical Society for sharing those incredible photos that, that we saw there. Pretty cool to see. Yeah. You can find more stories and answers about the lake's historic drought from local reporters and experts at greatsaltlakenews.org. There you can also learn about the Great Salt Lake Collaborative. It's a solutions journalism effort that made this story possible. Can Utah survive the fastest growing rate in the country in the second driest state when water is already in short supply? New specialist Dan Spindle sat down with Governor Cox to talk about the critical need for conservation. Not everywhere is taking it that seriously, with the worst example being Utah. Is it a fair designation to say, Utah, what's going on with you guys? You guys just waste water out there. <laughs> well, I, I don't think it's a fair designation, but, but I think it is a fair criticism that we haven't been as effective as, as we should have been in the past when it comes to conserving water, and specifically the Great Salt Lake. So I think we, we should be open to criticism, and that means we can do better. We've been victims a little bit of, of, of our own success historically in that the people that came before us we're really, really good at, at storing water. 
And so we have this incredible reservoir system. We actually had an abundance of water. And so that, that's led us to this point where I think we got a little lackadaisical. Um, why conserve when you don't have to? We have these reservoirs full of water. We're doing just fine. Why put limits on, on the amount of water that people can use? And you couple that now with being the fastest growing state in, in the country. And we're in this 20 year drought. And that's a combination that now makes it so we don't have enough water. We've talked a lot about the water levels at the Great Salt Lake and how its shrinking size poses a risk for all of us living here in Utah. Tonight, a biology professor breaks down how the ecosystem is dangerously close to collapsing altogether and what can be done to save it. New specialist Dan Spindle has a story. And it's just the water is full of dead brine fly larva and pupa. Just death everywhere. It's terrible. Bonnie Baxter talks a lot about death these days. This microbiolite is probably hundreds of years old, and it's just dead. She has reason to be pessimistic about the prospect of a healthy, thriving Great Salt Lake. We are at the tipping point for this ecosystem. As a biologist and director of the Great Salt Lake Institute, who studied this body of water for more than two decades, Bonnie's take on the lake really holds water. Yeah. A few years back, she co-authored a dark, satirical obituary of our massive saline staple, penning this untimely cause of death. The combination of terminal dehydration and high fever killed the Great Salt Lake, she said. And had we adequately funded her health care in time, we may not be mourning her death today. Since the lake has been in this perilous state, I've been getting emails and letters and phone calls constantly. Now she hopes that fresh concern from her cautionary tale draws the hearts and minds of Utahns toward the salty shore. This is essentially the ever-changing edge of the Great Salt Lake at Buffalo Bay. But if we turn our attention that way, toward Antelope Island itself, you can see a timeline of sorts showing us the shrinking Great Salt Lake. Here, this line you can see of what is left over, the remnants of the brine flies, the effective cocoons here, making this line of where the water level would have been. Take the timeline even further back to last year. Here we are with 2021's Water's Edge. This could be the Water's Edge in 2020. Another 20, 30 yards back, and we're at the spot for 2019, then 2018. And over the better part of the last decade, we have lost hundreds and hundreds of yards to what is now the current edge of the Great Salt Lake. As this water evaporates, the salt stays behind, yeah. and it just gets more and more concentrated, and it starts to threaten the ecosystem that way. This ecosystem is anything but a dead sea. It begins and ends with what Bonnie calls the building blocks of life from billions of years ago microbialite mounds that feed the lake, that in turn feeds millions of birds through countless brine shrimp and flies. In a place where water literally is life, it's going to take a change in the way we think about conservation. We enjoy coming out here. We enjoy bringing people out here. Miriam Oliver has lived in Utah for almost 15 years and was shocked to see the growing distance between the parking lot and the beach. You do have to worry about how much water we are using. As sample after sample returns the same dire results of an unsustainable level of salt. That's at about 18%. I asked Bonnie if it's too late. Is the death of the lake um, imminent, like her obituary foretold? She told me one thing could take the lake off life support. The one thing is the big thing, get more water to the lake. And there's a lot of things that have to happen to do that. I believe there's enough water in the watershed to get water to this lake. I do believe that. I would be willing to write, <laughs> to change the obituary to a Lifetime Achievement Award if we see progress in five years. Reporting from Antelope Island, Dan Spindle, KSL 5 News. Well, you can find a lot more stories under the Great Salt Lake section on ksltv.com and information on the Great Salt Lake Collaborative as we look for ways to save this precious resource of water in our state.